Uh, yes, please. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Feliciano Giustino, and I'm from the uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so today, basically, we're going to start with a, a lecture on the theory of electron phone interactions. And, um, you know, the way uh, we usually uh, did this is to have uh, an introductory lecture um, based on very simple arguments uh, to explain what one can obtain, what one can calculate in this field. Uh, so since it is a little bit of a shorter uh, school, because um, we have both, uh, you know, electron phonon and electron electron interactions uh, with EPW and Berkeley GW, uh, this time we decided to, to jump directly to uh, more advanced concepts. So in this lecture, we will cover the many body theory of electron phonon interactions. And, um, uh, you know, you will see a lot of equations. And what I would like to say is that uh, you don't need to necessarily follow every detail. Uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, lecture slides will be available online. So this is mostly for you to, to kind of get an idea of where things come from and then uh, have a reference to go back to if you have any questions. So the way uh, the, the, this lecture is structured is uh, uh, the following. So I will uh, say a few words about why we care about electron phone interactions. Uh, and then I will uh, uh, proceed to the, uh, you know, um, discussing the theory. So first I will explain how we understand the mechanisms whereby phonons change the properties of electrons. And then in the second part, uh, we will see the reverse. So how electrons affect the properties of uh, phonons, okay? Uh, so let me uh, give you a very brief introductory slide. So why do we care about electron phone interactions? Well, um, the reason is that these uh, phenomena are a little bit everywhere in uh, solid state physics. Uh, for example, on the top left, this is a uh, you know pretty rendering of a uh, two-dimensional uh, field effect transistor based on molybdenum sulfide from this paper here. And the idea is that uh, by changing the the voltage between the gate and the and the and the, and the drain, uh, you have a you can modulate the flow charge across this uh, two-dimensional material. And when electrons go through this material, they will experience scattering by uh, phonons and this will alter their uh, transport properties. So electron phone interactions are important in this context. Uh, the example at the bottom is uh, just a picture of uh, silicon uh, solar cells, as you may see in the rooftops. So uh, I think everybody in the audience will know that um, silicon is a indirect gap semiconductor, meaning that the first direct optical transitions occur around the three electron volts. So if we were not uh, uh, if we were not for the electron phonon interactions, uh, silicon would be completely transparent to uh, sunlight, which is uh, mostly in the infrared. Uh, so electron phonon interactions in this context are important for uh, 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 understanding uh, light absorption. And I forgot to mention that uh, the first example on transport will be discussed um, in the next lecture by Samuel Ponce, and then uh, there will be a tutorial on that. Uh, by Josh Leveillier, uh, Leveille, and then uh, uh, the second case, uh, the phonon-assisted um, optical absorption, uh, will be discussed by uh, um, uh, Manos Kupakis and uh, Xiao Zhang uh, uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, the example on the top right is about superconductivity, is a famous um, you know levitation experiment based on the Meissner effect. Uh, superconductivity. Uh, you know, can happen in, in many forms, but, uh, you know, the, the mechanism that we understand today is the one that is mediated by phonons. Uh, so that's uh, one of the maybe most spectacular manifestations of electron phone interactions. So this will be discussed um, by uh, uh, Roxana Margine and uh, Hitoshi Mori uh, also in the next couple of days. And finally, you, you, you see electron phone interactions in uh, maybe the photophysics, uh, or even, you know, of... Uh, 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 quantum materials or uh, defects uh, 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 used for quantum information. This is just a rendering of a germanium vacancy defect in uh, 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 in uh, uh, in uh, 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 diamond. And basically, in this case, what happens is that you, when you shine light uh, with a certain frequency, the system can emit light uh, at a lower frequency. And this difference in frequency is called Stokes shift, and it has to do uh, with the uh, electron phonon interactions. So all of these things can be uh, in kind of studied today. Um, and uh, what we need for this is uh, to develop a, a unified theory that allows us to rationalize all these phenomena and that allows us to uh, essentially put together equations that we can uh, then calculate uh, using uh, uh, first principles methods, uh, essentially based on density functional theory and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, many body perturbation theory. Uh, 
So um, let me uh, give you a second introduction and uh, introductory slide on the electron-fold interactions. So I just want to uh, give you a sense of what these interactions are about. So what you're looking at here is the uh, band structure of diamond. So this is the valence bands. Uh, it's a, uh, the system is a standard um, tetrahedral semiconductor with, um, you know, carbon atoms that uh, are uh, connected to their neighbors, uh, you know, in a fourfold tetrahedral arrangement. Uh, there are um, two uh, atoms per unit cell for a total of eight valence um, uh, uh, electrons. And these electrons are distributed in these uh, four bands. So you have a first band here, second here, and then these are doubly degenerate. So this will be the band structure for the atoms in the equilibrium sites. Now let's imagine moving the atoms according to a, one of the optical modes of diamonds. So if you take an optical mode at the um, gamma point, so um, you know long wavelength, uh, all the atoms are moving um, kind of in the same way if you move uh, from one unit cell to another. And this is an optical mode that means that the nearest neighbor carbon atoms are moving in opposite directions. And in this example, I'm choosing to move the atoms by, let's say, 0.015 angstroms, just as a, as a you know, reasonable guess that corresponds approximately to the amplitude of vibrations of these atoms in um, you know, a, a room temperature. So when you do that and you recalculate the uh, band structure, you discover that the bands have been uh, uh, modified by this uh, vibration, by, by this displacement. In particular, we notice that um, this double degenerate band now has been uh, split into two bands. Uh, here, this uh, triple degenerate band has been split into three uh, uh, bands. And instead, for example, the, you know, the first band at the, the bottom has not been affected very much. So uh, the first thing we see is that uh, when you move atoms around, uh, you cause uh, some um, uh, distortions of the band structures. Now, this is uh, something that one might call electron phonon interaction effect. But there are many questions that arise from this figure. For example, one could ask, what happens if I use a displacement that is larger than this uh, 0.01? What happens if I double it? Well, if you try the calculation, you would see that this bleeding will increase. Uh, uh, and uh, then there is a question on, so what displacement should I use to represent a kind of study, you know, physical effect in, uh, in real materials? Another question one may ask is, uh, you know, this is just a static displacement that just distorting the structure. So the uh, phonons or lattice vibrations are truly oscillations of the, uh, of the atoms in the lattice. So what happens if I incorporate these oscillations? What you may might imagine is that uh, these oscillations will carry uh, some kind of energy and the acceleration coming uh, from the atoms might impart an acceleration to the electrons and they may change their uh, uh, electronic energy levels. So this will be non adiabatic effects that alter the, the, the energy levels of the uh, specific electrons. And that's something that is not incorporated in this figure. And then the, the last thing is that uh, if you look at a bus structure looking like this uh, in red, the, so the red circles, uh, one might ask, uh, okay, uh, you know, this bus structure uh, may give me uh, phonon dispersions and phonon energies that do not correspond to the ones of um, the diamond in the ground state. So how do I figure out what the change in bus structures, uh, uh, you know, what kind of effect, uh, uh, you know, that brings to the uh, phonon dispersion relations? So to answer all these questions, we need to develop a, a theory of electron phonon interactions. And I think uh, uh, today it's pretty, mm, uh, 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 you know, well established that the most rigorous and most general way to approach this problem is to go via uh, many body uh, uh, kind of quantum field theory approaches. So that's what we're gonna try in this lecture. So we're gonna discuss how uh, uh, vibrations and electrons are connected. And to do this, we need to understand how the vibrations affect electrons and also how electrons affect vibrations. So in the first half, I will discuss the first bit. So how vibrations affect the, the properties of electrons. And then we will move to do the, the reverse. So how electrons affect vibrations. So first, uh, a starting point for any theory of interacting electrons and phonons is to uh, write down the Hamiltonian of the system. So this is the, uh, um, the, uh, the uh, many body uh, Schrodinger's equation in the non-relativistic form uh, for a set of interacting electrons and nuclei. So in everything that follows, uh, I indicates the electrons, kappa indicates the nuclei. So small m is the electron mass and the big M sub k is the um, uh, uh, mass of the nuclei. So here you see as usual kinetic energy of the electrons, kinetic energy of the nuclei. Then there is a V stands for uh, this object, the Coulomb potential, very simply. I use V just to avoid the repeating these uh, prefactors. Uh, 
So this is the Coulomb attraction between each electron and each nucleus. Then there will be a Coulomb repulsion between each uh, pair of nuclei and a Coulomb repulsion between each pair of electrons, okay? So that's a standard, um, you know, Schrodinger's equation you may see in any, um, uh, you know, introduction to, um, uh, um, you know, quantum mechanics. So in principle, we would like to study this equation and find solutions because this contains everything we need to know. However, uh, the problem here is that this equation uh, is very difficult to solve. Already, if you consider only the electrons and you fix the nuclear positions, this equation is extremely difficult to solve. If you also want to study what happens if you uh, allow the nuclei to move around, it becomes essentially impossible and there are no solutions available, even numerical around. So one has to find some other ways to, to proceed. So uh, one approach that has emerged, uh, uh, you know, in the past uh, now 70 years uh, is to use techniques borrowed from uh, particle physics that involve essentially uh, 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 quantum field theory. So to explain why people go there, let me just uh, use this simple example. So this would be the, let's say, a, the wave function of the electrons, okay? You have maybe n electrons and you have a, a function that depends on the coordinates of all these electrons. Now, uh, I don't know this function, but what I know is that maybe I can calculate the, um, the you know, the DFT bus structures, I can get a DFT con sham wave functions, and I can construct one slated determinant with this uh, wave function, right? Now, this is clearly not the exact ground state or one exact study state, but what I can do is to make operate, perform operations on this determinant. For example, I can define an operator uh, uh, C sub N here that removes one electron in the state N from this determinant. So it essentially creates a new determinant with uh, 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 one less electron. And then when I can have a, an operator C dagger that uh, creates an electron in this determinant in the state M. So this is just a way, for example, imagine to start from a ground state as a later determinant and create so remove an electron from the valence and place it in the conduction. That corresponds essentially to a new determinant. And this determinant is called a single excitation in quantum chemistry. So what I can do is to do that in many possible ways and then do linear combination of the determinants. And that will be a slight modification of my initial ground state. Clearly I can do uh, more complicated things. For example, I can remove two electrons and add them somewhere else. So there will be a double excitation. And I can continue uh, you know, along this way by creating triple excitation, quadruple excitation, and so on. So some of these techniques are using quantum chemistry, and we're not gonna go down this path because we don't want to work with this um, very large uh, kind of tensors that represent the coefficients. So the purpose of this uh, equation is just to uh, uh, say that um, uh, maybe one can change the perspective. Instead of working with um, uh, the many body Schrodinger's equation, we can try to play with these uh, uh, operators. So now uh, uh, let's see what happens if I start using operators. So what one can prove uh, using simple textbook uh, uh, kind of uh, quantum mechanics is that if I have a, a, a many body operator that uh, acts uh, on each electron individually, for example, the potential coming from the nuclei, this can be written exactly as uh, a summation that involves a, a, a annihilation operator, a, a creation operator, and the matrix elements in a given basis, for example, the basis of consham states. If I write this expression uh, explicitly, uh, I have the following. So this matrix element here is the product of a the, the uh, complex conjugate of, let's say, a Comsham state, the potential in the middle here, and then the other Comsham state, okay? So that's just a rewriting of the expression that we have here. Now, the interesting bit is that if you look at this and I start coloring it, you see that there is a blue sum here over M, there is psi M star here, and there is the uh, creation operator here. Then if you look at what I color in red, there is a summation over N, there is a uh, psi n, so this will be again constant states, and then an annihilation operator. So what you see in, in blue and in red is basically the uh, co co Hermitian conjugate of each other. So it is common to define so-called field operators that are essentially these summations. So the blue ones, I call it uh, field uh, electron field creation operator, and the red is what I call electron field uh, annihilation operator. So these are just linear combination of these discrete operators where the coefficient is the Consham wave function. Now, since this coefficient depends parametrically on the position, this operator acquires a dependence on the position itself. And now I can replace this red definition here, the blue one here, and I obtain that my total potential acting on the electrons can be expressed as an expectation value of the potential over these field operators. So the big advantage of this approach 
is that uh, on the left, I have the coordinates of all the electrons, while on the right, I have only the one coordinate, okay? And this expression looks very much like what we do in single particle quantum mechanics. The only difference is that I have hats here that denote operators, so I want us to be a bit careful, but the maths is uh, considerably simplified. So if I extend this to the entire Hamiltonian, what is going to happen is that uh, all of the terms of the Hamiltonian, kinetic energy, the electrons, the nuclei, the electronuclear attraction, and the repulsion between electrons and between nuclei can all be written in terms of these kind of operators. For example, the electron density is like in single particle quantum mechanics. In single particle quantum mechanics, we will say that the, if you have wave function psi, the density would be psi modulus square. And in uh, many body quantum mechanics, you have a very similar expression with psi dagger psi, where these are two operators. With this definition, for example, I can write the electron nuclear attraction energy as the electrostatic energy, so this Coulomb potential, between two distributional charges, the electron one and the nuclear one. The only difference with respect to kind of uh, um, uh, uh, classical electrostatics is that these two objects are operators now. Similarly, I can write the electron-electron interaction energy as the Coulomb uh, um, uh, repulsion between two charge density distributions uh, of the electrons and themselves, okay? So and I can do the same operation for uh, this term here and the kinetic energies. Now, let's try to see a little bit uh, what one can do with this kind of uh, uh, definitions, okay? So what I would like to do now is to provide a couple of definitions that we need to uh, use uh, to proceed uh, uh, into, you know, uh, with some of the equations. So let's assume that, uh, you know, I can perform, I can uh, find out the ground state of the uh, this Hamiltonian uh, for a system with n electrons. So to fix ideas, let's imagine that we're talking about diamond with eight electrons uh, per um, unit cell. So n here would be eight number of electrons and E sub n is the ground state energy. Now, suppose I want to calculate the band gap. What I can do is to try to add an extra electron and look at the excited states of the system. And I'm gonna call uh, E sub n plus one the energy of this excited state, okay? So uh, what people do in uh, many body uh, physics is, is to define the excitation energy as the difference in the total energies of the system with n plus one electron and the system with n electrons, okay? So that's just for now uh, definitions. So let's see what we can do now. Uh, you know, when you have a field operator, um, uh, you want to try to write down some equations, some uh, um, kind of like Schrodinger-like equations. And to do that, we need to uh, obtain some kind of uh, time dependence of these operators so we can take derivatives. So in the world of uh, this Hamiltonian I just written in the previous slide, since the Hamiltonian does not depend on time, we can say that the time dependence of the field operator can be written in the Heisenberg representation using the exponentiation with the Hamiltonian on the left and on the right, right? So this is just the standard quantum mechanics. If uh, uh, this is the case, uh, we can uh, now, uh, uh, you know, play some uh, maths uh, and see what, what this uh, object uh, uh, can give us. So I want to consider here in a simple exercise, the matrix element, of this operator, so the uh, this uh, annihilation operator between the ground state and the state with n plus one electrons, okay? So to do that, I just uh, replace this expression inside this bracket, and I have this object inside here. So if I act with the Hamiltonian on the right, I will have uh, in the exponent, the energy n plus one. And if I act with this Hamiltonian on the left, I will have E sub n on, on, this, uh, on this side. So when I put them together, I just uh, find scalars instead of operators here. And now I use the definition of uh, excitation energy to uh, transform that into this object that is outside of the bracket, okay? So now notice that this is a wave function with n plus one electrons. This is a wave function with n electrons. So how do I evaluate the integral? Well, we need to remind ourselves that this is an operator that removes one electron in this position x. Therefore, the psi applied to n plus one gives me a wave function with n electrons, and this integral is perfectly well defined. So this integral now will be a scalar, no longer an operator. And uh, the only thing is that this scalar depends on this uh, parameter here, which is the position. So this object is uh, essentially almost like a wave function and is what is called in, uh, in field theory, a Dyson orbital. If you want, this is uh, a, a cousin of the Consham orbital that you find in DFT calculations, okay? So this is useful for uh, you know uh, bringing these techniques close to DFT calculations. 
So now that we have time independence of the field operators, let me define an important quantity in this field, uh, that is the, the, the Green's function. So the Green's function is uh, uh, nothing but a function of two space-time variables, the uh, position and time of an electron and the position and, uh, and time of uh, the same electron, uh, you know, maybe somewhere else and, uh, you know, uh, some time later or earlier. So this is a uh, an object, a mathematical object, and this is its definition. So what you see here is uh, uh, that there is a ground state. So this would be, let's say, the ground state of diamond in the example that we are using. Uh, these are the two operators we just introduced, and this is what is called the uh, time ordering operator. Uh, the way this operator works is that it tries to, um, uh, it, it, it basically orders the times so that they increase towards the left, meaning that if the time t is greater than t prime, the operator doesn't do anything. If the time t is more than t prime, this operator swaps the operators and that's a minus sign to this expression, okay? So what this definition, uh, does this definition mean? First of all, let me know that this essentially a, is, a, a, is a correlation function between uh, the creation of an electron in two different points at two different times. Maybe this is gonna be clear if I color this way. So this uh, side dagger applied to n essentially corresponds to taking the ground state and adding one electron at the point x prime at the time t prime. Now, if I look at what I see on the left, so this is essentially the same story, but just taking the Hermitian conjugate. So this is basically adding one electron to the ground state at position x and time t. So when I take two quantum states and I uh, perform the scalar product, what this gives me is the probability amplitude that one state is included in the is uh, incorporated no uh, is uh, included in the second state, so that's basically the amplitude for the probability of making a transition from the first position and time to the second position and time. Okay, so that's basically the meaning of Green's function. That's why we call it the propagator uh, of the electrons. So why do people uh, bother about the Green's function? Well, the reason is that it, it contains many useful properties, and it's basically the quantity that we need. To evaluate a lot of um, you know kind of uh, uh, physical properties of interest for um, you know uh, in uh, you know materials model. So uh, let me give you an example of uh, how we can write this expression, this, this Green's function, in a way that is uh, a little bit closer to what we are used to from DFT. Now I'm just going to consider the case of t greater than d prime, and in this case, basically the time ordering operator uh, doesn't do anything; it's just the identity. Okay, so what uh, I see that is that this is basically a, a, a situation where I'm creating an electron at this uh, position in time, okay? And then uh, T is greater than T prime, that means I'm, I'm looking where the electron is uh, in the future. So this uh, const, this, this uh, Green's function in this way describes the propagation of an electron added to the system and I'm looking in the future. Uh, I could do this, the opposite, consider T is more than T prime. And one can see if you look at the maths, that this corresponds to the propagation of a hole, so the, the, the lack of an electron in the past, okay? So let's try to, to, to write this in a way that uh, uh, can be uh, lead us to Dyson orbitals. So the expression of these two can be written using the Heisenberg time evolution, as we see in the previous slide. So I replace this by its Heisenberg time evolution, and this one here, the same. Then I can act with the Hamiltonian on the right and get the energy of the ground state. I can act with the Hamiltonian on the left and get the energy of the ground state. And then this, since do, these two operators must commute because it's just a scaling of the Hamiltonian, I can combine them in the same expression. If I do that, I basically obtain the Hamiltonian minus the energy of the ground state times t minus t prime in the exponent. In the exponent. So this is still a little bit far from the expression for the Dyson orbital that we had. For the Dyson orbitals, if you remember, it was a matrix element of this kind of operator between n and n plus one. So to recover that definition, what we can do is to add the uh, resolution of identity. So I uh, project over all possible excitation states of the n plus one system, both here and here. So these are identities, so I can always do that. Now, if you take this bra, then multiply by this object and this object, these three together form a Dyson orbital. And the same when I do this on the left, these three together form a Dyson orbital. And the advantage is that now, if I act with this Hamiltonian, for example, on this state, I can pull out the energy of the system with n plus one electrons, and this parenthesis will give me the excitation energy. So when I do these steps, basically the Green's function becomes just a product of two Dyson orbitals and uh, an exponent that contains the excitation energy. So this is almost at the end of the story for the Green's function. 
I just want to mention that you can do the same operation for T smaller than T prime, and then you can do a Fourier transform to see what happens. After you do that, you discover that the Green's function in the frequency domain can be written as the product to two decimal orbitals, and then you have denominators that contain the frequency of the Green's function and then the excitation energy. So the important message here is that if you can calculate the, the Green's function, you look for the poles, and these poles give you the many body addition removal energies of the system. And this is exactly the way we calculate band gaps within the GW method that uh, uh, Zheng Lu uh, will uh, describe in, in the next few days. If you take the imaginary part of this function, you basically manage to transform these denominators into Dirac delta functions, and that leads to uh, what we would call a density of states. So that means that from the Green's function, we can calculate the density of electronic states. So it's like the D DFT density of states, the difference is that these are many body density of states. So uh, let me give you an example of uh, what these poles in the Green's functions mean. Let's imagine that we have a pole that is sitting here, basically as a real component, an imaginary component. I've read this inside the Green's function that I gave you earlier. So the exponent will have the epsilon from the real part and then minus i gamma from the imaginary part. Since there was already minus i here, what is going to happen is that uh, uh, this gamma term becomes a real valued object and uh, it defines essentially a decay over time, okay? So in other words, whenever you have a, 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 an imaginary component in the poles of your Green's function, you are looking at decaying quasi-particles. So if I take the, the Fourier transform of that and I transform into a, a spectral function, this becomes a Lorentzian. The Lorentzian is a width gamma, so this width is connected to this uh, decay time, and I can try to plot it as a band structure, for example, I have the energy here, the wave vector here. This would be for a simple parabolic band. Instead of having a sharp band structure, I have basically a band that is slightly broadened. The broadening gamma comes from this uh, 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 Lorentzian here. And this broadening is exactly the inverse of the lifetime of the electron. So what that means in practice, for example, suppose I inject one electron uh, in the conduction band of diamond, one electron volt above the band bottom. So this electron is not going to stay there forever. It will try to reach the bottom of the band, and the time needed to do that uh, is connected with the broadening of this band. Okay, so that's basically the idea that is contained in these um, uh, excitation energies and uh, their uh, uh, imaginary parts. So what happens in practice if you do a DFT calculation and then you move to many body calculations? The following: suppose in DFT you have only one eigenvalue. And basically, you you uh, uh, you have only one band and uh, you know one k point, so you would have just uh, one peak in the density of states. Then you switch on uh, many body interactions. This could be GW effects, or it could be electron phone interactions. So you have something that uh, going to have a density of states is going to look like the following typically. So that has a, a shift on the energy. So that's the quasi-particle shift. For example, if you do a GW correction with band gap, usually band gap increases, right? So this would be the, the quasi-particle shift. The, 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 the peak also broadens, so that means that the, the, the electrons uh, or the holes, they acquire a finite lifetime. And then you have also some other structure here that typically corresponds to shake up excitations, meaning that when you remove or add an electron, you are bothering the system and you disperse some energy into other features that have nothing to do with your electron, okay? So this is what we call usually incoherent uh, 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 satellite structures. So uh, now uh, the question that one might ask is, okay, this is all uh, uh, you know, interesting, but uh, how do I calculate this Green's function and how do I, I, I transform these ideas into something that I can really connect to my DFT calculations? So the idea actually is uh, 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 quite simple. The idea is to try and write a Schrodinger's equation for the Green's function. And the way we do that is the following. So we know that the Green's function consists of essentially a, a, a expectation value of uh, field operators, okay? And the field operators uh, is defined, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we have a time dependence for those, which is defined by the Heisenberg time evolution. So certainly I can write a Schrodinger's equation for those uh, by taking a derivative on the left-hand side. This will pull down a Hamiltonian on the left and one Hamiltonian on the right. On the right, there will be also a minus sign. So if I take a time derivative of this object, I will find that this time derivative will be equal to the commutator on the uh, field operator with the Hamiltonian. So that's basically the equation of motion for the field operator, and is essentially something looking like a Schrodinger's equation. Why? The reason is that if I take the Hamiltonian I give you in the first few slides, and you evaluate this, this commutator, 
you obtain this simple equation, which has the kinetic energy. And then you have as a potential, the electrostatic potential generated by the total distribution of charge in the system, okay? So now the, the beauty of this equation, if you uh, look carefully is the following. Suppose I remove the hat from here and from here and from here. This will be simply the standard Schrodinger's equation for a single particle that is uh, 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 moving under the potential generated by a, a classical charge density distribution, okay? So it's very, very simple. And that's why people like this kind of approach. The only complication is that now these are not really functions, but these are uh, operators. So that requires a little bit more uh, kind of uh, uh, work to, to get the, the equations right, but at least the, the expressions are very simple. And most importantly, we are not dealing with many electron variables. We are dealing just with one position variable. So if you have the, the, the change of the function with time, you can also evaluate the change of the, of the Green's function with time because the Green's function has two field operators. If you do that, you discover that the Green's function obeys this equation. There is also in this case, there is a time derivative on this side. The kinetic energy appears here. And then the derivatives of this object are a little bit more complicated and they give you this uh, strange integral here. Now, this equation is still exact, but is not very useful because if you look at this, this is something that contains the density of the electrons and the nuclei. The density of the electrons, for example, has two field operators. So this expression has four field operators. Okay, that's very complicated. Four field operators, uh, uh, if you, you know, look at the uh, textbooks on this, essentially corresponds to combinations of two particle green functions. So that means that this expression actually is not that simple because I want to look for an equation for the Green's function, but I end up with an equation that also contains a Green's function of two particles. Well, one could try to write the equation for a Green's function of two particles, but then what you discover is that you will uh, uh, have one term contain the Green's function of three particles, and then you continue going on. Essentially, there is no end to this kind of uh, connection to between the Green's function of two or three or four or five particles and so on. So here, the breakthrough that came around the, uh, the 60s uh, came from Hedin, so the same Hedin of the uh, GW, where, which had, who had the idea of basically transforming this term into something that can be written in terms of the Green's function itself. So the way it looks is, is the following. I take that and I rewrite it as an integral that contains the Green's function and an object called self-energy. So the way I do this actually is uh, by really defining the self-energy so that this integral is equal to the difficult term that I, I showed in the, in the previous slide. So in a way, uh, this is not really uh, simplifying my life too much uh, because I'm, you know, I'm con you know, this contains the same physics. It's just rewriting things in a way that one can uh, maybe make some progress uh, using some approximations. Now, the advantage of having an expression like that is that I can now use the Green's function written using Dyson orbitals like product of two dozen orbits with the denominators containing the, the uh, excitation energies. And if I do that, I obtain equations for the dozen orbitals that look a lot like the uh, Kohn-Sham equations of DFT. For example, this V dot here would be the Kohn-Sham potential. This would be F would be the uh, like a, your Kohn-Sham wave function. And uh, uh, so this epsilon S would be your Kohn-Sham again value. And the only difference is that we have an extra potential coming from this uh, uh, mysterious self-energy that we still need to determine, okay? But the bottom line is that even starting from a very uh, advanced formalism, uh, we can go back to a situation that looks a lot like density functional theory. And in fact, the way these methods are used is that we start from DFT and then we try to add these parts uh, using perturbation theory. And this is what is called many body perturbation theory. And just to, to, to be clear, the electron volume interactions in this story will be contained in this expression and in this expression, okay? So let me uh, just tell you how the self-energy uh, looks like uh, after you do some maths. So we don't have the time to go through the details, but basically this would look like a, a product of the Green's function, an object called the vertex, and W, which is called the screen and Coulomb interaction. So for those of you who have done GW calculations, this is exactly the same that you find in the GW method. In practice, the Green's function is what you already discussed. The vertex is a very complex object that we usually neglect because it's too difficult to compute. And this W, is the Coulomb interaction between electrons modified by the dielectric screening uh, of the system. Now, in the GW method, you would have only the screening coming from the electrons. If you want to study electron volume interactions, you also add the screening coming from the nuclei. 
Okay, so that's pretty much um, what we have. So all of these things can be uh, kind of represented in a diagrammatic way to, to make things easy um, and uh, easy to remember. So in practice, what you can show is that uh, the self-energy can be written as a product of the electron Green's function times this screen Coulomb interaction. And as I say, we usually neglect this vertex. Then the, this is what we call the GW uh, self-energy. And we're not gonna discuss that because this belongs really to the lectures that uh, Stephen Louis and Zheng Luli will present um, uh, uh, Thursday and, and Friday. Then there is uh, the first term that has to do with electron four interaction, which we call the Fermi-Middle self-energy. It is basically the product of the Green's function of the electron, the Green's function of the phonons that we'll discuss later, and two uh, so-called electron phonon matrix elements. So these are the probability amplitude for an electron to scatter from one state to the other due to a phonon. Then there is a third self-energy, uh, which is called the debye waller self-energy. It's a little bit weirder because the phonon line folds onto itself. So this is somewhat of an improper self-energy because what it really comes from is the fact that the nuclei are not really uh, point particles in many body, in a many other approach, but they're a little bit fuzzy because they oscillate, uh, uh, you know, even at zero temperature, they oscillate near the equilibrium sites. So this oscillation causes a little bit of fuzziness in the in nuclear density, and this is reflected into this uh, kind of um, uh, contribution to the uh, uh, self-energy. So let's just uh, now, let me tell you what, uh, you know, this uh, familiar self-energy is. So in practice, if you uh, convert what I told you into the language of DFT, this can be computed and it consists of uh, a, an integral over all possible wave vectors of the phonons of the electron phonon matrix element here, square, and then products of the electron and phonon Green's function that, that basically become a uh, some uh, 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 ratios where you have the electron occupation, that's a Fermi Dirac at the top, and both occupation of the phones here. And then in the denominator, you have a electron energies and phonon energies, okay? And this is what gives, uh, you know, electrons uh, uh, some interesting properties. For example, uh, you know, the change of the electron mass and some finite uh, lifetimes. So let me show you how this looks for a very simple example. So this is a, a, an example of a parabolic electron band. So this would be what we call the, the free electron gas. So uh, these are non-interacting electrons. The blue line is the Fermi level. Now I want to zoom in this region here. So this will be the same uh, as this uh, yellow bit uh, uh, on, the, on the left side. And uh, this is the band that uh, we have on the left, this black band. This is essentially non-interacting electron bands. Suppose now I, I, I switch on the self-energy corresponding to a dispersionless optical phonon. So this will transform into something looking more like that where you have uh, several you know, noticeable features. First of all, you know, the band is no longer like this uh, original straight line, but it follows this kind of uh, 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 twisted pattern. And we say that this uh, feature here, this distortion, uh, is a change of velocity that uh, sometimes people call the kink in uh, uh, studies based on photoelectron spectroscopy. So this feature usually appears uh, in, you know, at an energy that is comparable to the phonon energy. Then you notice that actually here the bands are pretty sharp, but then they become very, very broad as soon as you overcome the phonon energy. So this is because as the, the, the hole that you have in the system has an energy higher than the phonon energy, it can decay by emitting a phonon, and therefore the lifetime here is much shorter than in this range. And then the last bit is that here the, the velocity of the electron and therefore the mass has changed as a result of the electron-phonon interaction. So these are the typical things that you can expect from uh, this uh, familiar self-energy. And this is not something just uh, for theoreticians. So if you do experiments, for example, this is magnesium diboride, is an angle result for the electron spectroscopy experiment. This is essentially one of the bands that you see in magnesium diboride. The dashed line will be what you calculate from DFT, okay, in straight bands near the Fermi level. But what they measure is something which has this kind of um, uh, 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 distortion in the band. And the change of the velocity here with respect to the DFT bands is uh, more than a factor of two. So this means that the effective mass of the electrons are modified by more than a factor of two by the electron phonon interaction, okay? So this is pretty uh, pretty significant effect in the case of systems with strong electron phonon couplings. So uh, uh, how do we rationalize these things uh, in, a, you know, in a more systematic terms? Once I include the self-energy in the Green's function, what happens is that in the my spectral function, I have a denominator that is no longer, no longer as poles at the, and the uh, uh, you know DFT again malice, 
but this, these poles are shifted by the uh, electron uh, self energy, and that means that uh, uh, you know I can uh, try to see the, where are the new poles by manipulating this expression. Usually, what people do is to assume that this is very smooth, and therefore you can do a Taylor expansion. And when you do that, you transform this expression into something that looks like a Lorentzian with new poles, with some kind of broadening, and with a modification of the normalization. So the uh, new poles are the original DFT energies plus a shift that corresponds to the real part of the self energy. Then the broadening is the imaginary part of the self energy, and this is essentially connected to the lifetime. And the strength of this pole has to do with the derivative of the self energy with respect to the frequency. Okay, so these three properties are what one usually calculates when you want to determine the effect of phonons on the electron mass structure. Uh, in particular, from the real part of the self energy, we can calculate what is called the mass renormalization. So, how much the mass of the electron increases uh, uh, due to electron phone interaction. And that has to do with the slope of the self energy in the frequency domain. Another thing you can do is to calculate the lifetime of the electrons. As I said, this has to do with the reciprocal or the imaginary part of the electron self energy. And uh, if you try to express that in terms of uh, cone sham states and uh, matrix elements, you find that an expression looking like this, where you have that the lifetime of an electron has to do with the an integral of electron form matrix m square, and then some expressions that have to do with the occupation factors and some Dirac delta functions that uh, take into account of the energy conservation when an electron emits or absorbs a phonon. So this expression, if you've uh, ever seen uh, you know, the semi-classical models of electron dynamics in solids, uh, is exactly the same that you find by using the Fermi golden rule. So uh, this is to say that uh, many body approaches are not uh, kind of uh, 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 providing something completely uh, different from uh, you know, more uh, uh, you know, simpler uh, uh, empirical approaches. So under uh, suitable approximations, we always recover the same kind of, uh, of physics. So this expression is what is key to calculate, for example, the scattering rates that you need for uh, uh, calculating transport properties, as it will be discussed in the uh, uh, next uh, lecture. And just as an example, this is a calculation on uh, on uh, one of these uh, uh, halide perovskites that people are interested in for photovoltaics. It's basically just a perovskite that contains lead and iodine. Um, and uh, what you're looking at here is a many body bus structures, including electron phone interactions. So the, the, the blue dashed line is the original DFT bands. And then the color map is basically the spectral function after including electron phonon effects. So the maxima of the, this kind of this spectral function have changed. So if you follow the maxima, you end up on the black line. And this black line is essentially a renormalized mass, uh, bus structure with a mass that is about 30% higher than the DFT mass. Then you also see that the dispersions here are very, very sharp, uh, you know, below maybe 20 milli electron volts. Then they start becoming very broad. So the reason is that 20 milli electron volts in the system is about the energy of the longitudinal optical phonon. So below this energy, an electron cannot decay by emitting a phonon. But as soon as you overcome this energy, you can do this kind of process. And therefore, the lifetime of the electron becomes much shorter. So this is the kind of things that one can calculate using these, um, you know, simple uh, expressions. Okay. So in the remaining time, uh, so maybe uh, I'm going to take seven, eight minutes on what is left. I would like to move from the uh, how we study what electrons do to what vibrations do to electrons to the other side of the equation, which is how electrons affect lattice vibrations. So the concepts are very similar. Therefore, I will uh, kind of maybe skip some steps. So the idea is that we want to understand how to calculate phonon dispersion relations, right? And that clearly has to do with uh, you know uh, solving again the uh, you know this many body Schrodinger's equation. So as in the case of the electrons, where we uh, have the Green's function, in the case of vibrations, we need to define a Green's function for the uh, phonons, and that's the usual definition. Basically, it is a correlation function of the atomic displacements uh, between two different atoms and two different times. Okay, so instead of having the field operator here for the electron and uh, basically field creation and field annihilation. In the case of the phonons, you have the displacements of these uh, uh, atoms. Once you have that, what you can uh, ask is how do the atomic displacement evolve with time? Well, I can uh, write them in the Heisenberg representation as, as for the electrons, and then I can take derivatives and I discover something that is identical to the field creation and annihilation operator for the electrons. So basically, this is um, a, a Liouville type equation for the displacements. And from that, I can evaluate derivatives of this. Um, uh, 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 Green's function for the uh, displacements. So in particular, I can take a second derivative, 
obtaining a equation that looks like the Newton's equation here. So, you know, mass times acceleration equals something. You can check that this is, as I mentioned, a force because you have a Hamiltonian square is an energy square. There is H bar square denominator, which is an action square. So this is mass displacement divided by time square, which is a force. So we basically recover some kind of Newton equation. So if we have the force, okay, defined purely in terms of the Hamiltonian, then I can take derivatives, and those derivatives will give me the force constants, and from that I can proceed to obtain the the uh, phonon dispersion relations. So in practice, what we do is to write equation of motion from the phonon Green's function. If you do the maths, you obtain something like this, where uh, this object here is what we call the phonon self energy. So this is very similar to the electron self energy we've seen uh, for the electrons. I will tell you in a second how this is calculated in practice. So for now, let me just show you that uh, uh, you know this is uh, uh, as a, a very clean expression when we uh, uh, use the uh, dielectric screening. So the phonon self energy here depends on the atomic site and atomic and the Cartesian coordinates alpha, and is obtained basically by taking the second derivative with respect to the atomic displacement of this object. So what is this object? It's basically the Coulomb electrostatic energy between two nuclei screened by the electronic dielectric uh, uh, function. So let me uh, uh, say uh, better, take two atoms, okay, in two different places, and you evaluate the Coulomb interaction between these two atoms, that's just the Coulomb potential, but then you screen it by the dielectric constant of the system, okay? So here, to do things properly, we don't use the dielectric constant, we use the immersed dielectric matrix. And this is exactly the energy that we need to look at when calculating the, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this uh, phonon self energy. There is a little change. So one has to include a little correction term that is needed to uh, uh, satisfy the acoustic sum rule, but we don't need to bother about that. But the bottom line is that to determine the dynamics of the lattice, all we need is this phonon self energy and the phonon self energy is simply the electrostatic interaction between nuclei screened by the electronic dielectric matrix. Okay, so that's the key physics here. Now, the expression I gave you can be written in a matrix notation, so we don't need to go into the details. But basically, uh, all the, these monster equations can be written as a, something in a reciprocal space where you have mass, frequency squared, Green's function equal identity, phonon self energy, and displacement uh, Green's function again. And if you have that, you can immerse and find a formal solution where the Green's function is written in a way that looks a lot like the electron Green's function. In fact, what I can do at this point is to look for the poles of this function, and these poles will correspond to my resonant frequencies, which are the phonon frequencies. If I pull out the mass matrix, I obtain a, an expression like that, where uh, to find the poles, I need to equate my frequency square to the basically eigenvalues of this object. So this object here, is what we call the many body dynamical matrix, okay? Is the phonon self energy divided by the square root of the atomic masses. So this is a Hermitian object. So I can diagonalize it, get the eigenvalues, and then set these eigenvalues equal to the frequency here to find the poles. And these poles, as in the case of electrons, give me the uh, resonant frequencies of the system, okay? So this is to say that there is a very well-defined approach to obtain phonon frequencies within a many body field theoretic framework okay now you know what are what is the link of what i'm telling you now to with density functional perturbation theory so for example you perform a calculation of phonons using the quantum espresso phonon uh, code and one may wonder how that relates to what i'm telling you here actually the relation is uh, uh, pretty straightforward and we can see it the following way so this is the expression for the self energy that i gave you okay now, notice that if I look at this uh, uh, function for a standard semiconductor or insulator, suppose you take silicon, the band gap is about 1.1 electron volts, the dielectric function as a function of frequency will look more or less like this, okay, at long wavelengths. If that is the case, the phonon energy of silicon is maybe 60 milli electron volts, so it will sit here. So when I evaluate this function, uh, this frequency omega will be about the phonon energy. So I will have to evaluate the screening about this point. At this point, the function in black is pretty much flat. Therefore, I can replace this frequency by omega equal zero. Okay, so that means I can, I can perform a adiabatic approximation where I use the static screening instead of the dynamic screening. So that's what uh, I obtain uh, when uh, uh, essentially I take the self energy, but I set omega equal zero. That corresponds to saying that 
I let electrons adjust to the atomic displacement, uh, you know, uh, in uh, with as much time as they want. Okay, so I wait the relax to the ground state, and uh, for that reason, I use the static screening. If I do that, my expression for the self energy simplifies a lot, and it gives me exactly what you find for density function and perturbation theory. So if you go to the review paper by Stefano Baroni and co-workers on density function and perturbation theory, you will find that the interatomic force constants are given precisely by the expression. The only difference between what we're doing and what is written in that review paper is that here, this is the many body density of the electrons, while in DFT, that would be the DFT electron density. Everything else remains the same. So that means that if I make the adiabatic approximation to the many body self energy, and I use the DFT electron density, I recover exactly the phonon interatomic force constants that you calculate using the FPT, okay? So this is an important point, and it means that if you start from a many body theory, you recover exactly, you know, density function and perturbation theory. Now, the other thing that we can ask is, you know, what happens if I now go beyond this adiabatic approach? Well, what I can do is to write the, my complete expression, non-adiabatic, my adiabatic Green's function, what we do with the, let's say, the FPT force constants, take the difference and whatever is left in the self energy, I call it non-adiabatic effects, okay? So this is what I need to make everything exact. And if I arrange, basically I obtain a Dyson equation where I start from the DFPT uh, uh, phonon frequencies, and then by adding the phonon uh, uh, non-aerobatic self-energy, I find the exact solution. So how does it look in practice? Well, the, the DFPT Green's function looks like the standard Green's function for electrons. So it's a sum of poles that uh, are sitting at the phonon frequencies with infinite lifetime. As soon as I add self-energy, I acquire another term in the denominator, and this term will act like for the electron self-energy. So the real part will give me shifting from frequencies. The imaginary part will give me lifetimes. So let me just show you uh, uh, quickly how that looks. So the, 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 as soon as I add this body self energy, I have a shift in the phonon frequencies that comes from the real part. And I have a lifetime that is one over the imaginary part of this self energy. So in practice, if I take a phonon in the FPT, so it will be this bar, infinite lifetime sitting somewhere. I include this self energy effect the phonon frequency shifts, and then the, the peak also broadens uh, due to this uh, finite uh, lifetime effects. So the, the, the phenomenology is identical to what we found for, for electrons. Self-energy gives uh, renormalization plus uh, broadening, that is uh, lifetime effects. So also, as in the case for the electrons, one can write down the expression for this self-energy that one can calculate in practice. Self-energy is similar to one for electrons in a matrix element here some uh, you know, uh, ratio that involve uh, occupations and uh, uh, energies or electrons and phonons. And the only thing I would like to mention here is that uh, in this expression, you see that you have uh, occupation of the electrons in the final state and in the initial state. So for this expression here to be non-zero, one has to be occupied and one has to be empty in terms of electronic states. So you cannot have empty, empty or occupied, occupied. So this means that this expression will also only be important where uh, the two electrons involved uh, are one uh, below the Fermi level and one above the Fermi level. As a result, this expression will be essentially negligible if you look at wide gap insulators or large gap semiconductors, and it will only be important in the case of metals, semi-metals, and the general semiconductors. So this means that non adiabatic effects on the electrons, or sorry, on the phonons, meaning lifetimes and shifts, are important only in very specific cases, okay? So how important are those? So this is an example from a famous paper by, by the group of Francesco Mauro in 2007 about the, the uh, con anomaly in graphene. So this was an experiment where uh, 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 the group of Andrea Ferrari performed Raman spectroscopy by doping graphene and changing the, car, the, the electron concentration. So what they found by Raman is that as you change electron concentration, the phonon frequency of the E2G mode actually changes quite a lot. If you perform the FPT calculation, so static uh, calculation using the phonon code, you find this red dashed line. So there is no change in the, in the phonon frequencies. And that's because this is a non-adiabatic effect. So you can only capture it if you include this non-adiabatic self-energy. It has to do with the fact that the electrons actually don't have enough time to uh, readjust to the atomic uh, displacements. And therefore, uh, you know, they are not able to screen the frequencies. And after you include this effect, you get these blue lines that reproduce the experimental data. 
Similar effect is observed in diamond. So in this study, basically, uh, you take diamond, you dope it with holes by replacing uh, a kind of some carbon atoms with boron. And uh, these are inelastic X-ray scattering experiments. This will be the phonon dispersions in the undoped crystal. And this is the phonon dispersions after you dope it. So when you dope it, basically, you move the Fermi level below the, the valence man top. So here there is a band bending, okay, due to the softening. And then there is a significant broadening. As you incorporate this non aromatic effect using self-energy, you find the same in the theory. So the bands here are bending due to the self-energy effect, and there is a significant broadening that comes from uh, these uh, uh, electron phonon interactions. So all these effects actually are important, as I say, in a system like graphene, a semi metal, and a system like a boron doped diamond, which is a uh, degenerate uh, doped uh, uh, semiconductor. So I would also like to mention that these uh, uh, expressions can also be used to calculate phonon lifetimes that you may use for calculations of uh, uh, things like uh, lifetimes in uh, 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 lattice thermal transport. And the expression looks like that. So this is similar to what you find by uh, Fermi Golden Rule. The only thing I need to mention is that in most calculations that are done today, uh, instead of using the, this expression, which is the standard matrix element, and the matrix element only for the ionic potential, so not the constant potential, Typically, these are replaced by uh, the square of the Konshan potential, uh, the matrix of the Konshan potential. So this is what we would call the overscreen approximation, and it leads to some, uh, uh, you know, uh, some problems that are still uh, being investigated. So since I'm running late, I don't want to say much more about that, but I just want to warn you that in, in EPW, the self-energy is done within this overscreen approximation, so you need to use it with caution because this issue is still being debated. And I want to point out that there are uh, recent papers one by Andrea Marini, whose figure is here, uh, uh, basically showing that uh, uh, if you uh, 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 make this approximation, you may get uh, incorrect values for the uh, uh, phonon uh, lifetimes. And then there is a, uh, also a paper by uh, Jan Bergs uh, that uh, discusses the same issues. I think uh, different groups are reaching different conclusions here. So I would say that this is still uh, uh, under debate. So please use caution if you evaluate uh, uh, phonon lifetimes using these approaches. And finally, I'm going to conclude by just uh, uh, wrapping up and saying that uh, the three take-home messages are that uh, you know quantum field theory is the way to uh, uh, proceed systematically and rigorously to study electron phonon physics. Okay, there is a very systematic framework that we can use to do many things. Uh, the use of self-energies is important because in the case of electron, the self-energy gives us uh, the um, the electron uh, uh, electron uh, mass uh, enhancement and the electron lifetimes coming from electron phonon interactions. And in the case of phonons, you can get non adiabatic uh, uh, frequency shifts and also phonon lifetimes. So these are the, the key things to remember. And uh, uh, since we're going to post these slides online, uh, here you have some references which are all hyper hyperlinked. I just want to, to, to mention one reference which is particularly interesting. This is a paper by Stefan Uchen, co-workers that came out a couple of months ago in the archive. They basically generalize all I told you to the case of uh, non-equilibrium uh, electron phonon interactions. So uh, this paper kind of includes what I told you during this lecture, uh, but uh, uh, as a, a limiting case of uh, equilibrium systems, okay? So this is really worth reading because it's very comprehensive and, and very well done. So with that, I think I, I close and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Feliciano. Uh, I think there are three questions uh, on uh, in the Q&A, if you want to go to those first. Okay, so there is a, uh, so the first question, why is not KS by itself not in the uh, expansion? I think it is uh, in the expansion, basically. So if you, yeah, you can put in the expansion. There is absolutely no no problem with that. So you're saying that I forgot to put the, the ground state itself, but yeah, we can include it. So that that that, that line was mostly to, to mean that, you know, we can uh, write down uh, a, a general many body wave function in terms of this uh, uh, ground state plus singles, doubles and all that. So then there is another question. What is the major difference between the Dyson orbital and a Konsham orbital? So the, uh, the let's say, if you uh, solve these problems uh, within the context of perturbation theory, like you treat the self-energy as a small change with respect to uh, uh, the Konsham potential, for example, the, the Dyson orbital will simply be a, mod a slight modification of the uh, Konsham orbital. From a formal point of view, the complexity is that the Dyson orbital is not, so if you solve the entire problem, the Dyson orbital is not uh, uh, normalized in the same way and does not fulfill the same properties of uh, the Konsham orbital. 
The reason is that uh, uh, you the 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 quasi particle equations are no longer uh, 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 basically the solution of a Hermitian uh, problem because since we have lifetimes, there are complex uh, 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 poles, and that complicates the story. Usually, let's say, usually, practically always, we try to avoid that by treating diesel energies in perturbation theory. Then there's another question, which what kind of systems crystals would one usually expect a strong electron phone interaction? Is there a rule of thumb? Yes, I mean, that depends on what you're looking at. For example, in the case of some, uh, I mean, I think that the easiest way to think about that is if you move atoms in the system and these atoms are changing significantly the electrons of your orbitals, then you can expect a strong electron flow interaction. For example, the prototypical case of diamond, in that case, the matrix elements are usually very large. Uh, that's because the orbitals are, uh, at least in the valence, they are basically sp3 hybrids. So if you move two carbon atoms near each other, you are really changing the uh, electrostatics of the electron density sitting in the bonds, and that can have a big effect. If instead, for example, you are considering uh, orbitals in graphene, uh, these are uh, uh, PZ orbitals, they form the, the, uh, the, you know, the Dirac cone. Those PZ orbitals, if you move the carbon uh, uh, you know, around, they're not much affected by this uh, motion because the, the density of electrons is not sitting in the middle of the bond, okay? It's sitting outside of the plane. So usually by looking at the chemistry of the system, you can guess how strong the interaction might be. Then another question is, what properties can we get from this theory that we cannot get from a initial molecular dynamics? So, well, the, the, for example, if you look at the, at the electron lifetimes from electron phone interactions, you cannot that get that from a initial molecular dynamics. So in a initial molecular dynamics, you can, uh, for example, calculate the bands, at, you know, do many snapshots, and then downfold it and get some broadening. So that broadening is not the lifetime that the system would have you know, in, in, in the experiments, okay? Because the lifetime that this theory gives you is the actually the dynamic lifetime, meaning as atoms oscillate, they can promote an electron transition. In molecular dynamics, you are always in the ground state. So as the atoms oscillate, the uh, electrons remain in the ground state. Okay, so that's basically something that you cannot capture with the uh, MD. So what is the physical significance of the electron self-energy? So the significance is the fact that, you know, when you, uh, I mean, in principle, what you are doing is, is like in Konshan theory. Let, let, let's, let's think of the problem as uh, in Konshan. So if you have a many-body Hamiltonian, there is only the Coulomb interaction between electrons, right? So the electron-electron repulsion. When we do DFT, in order to rewrite everything to a single particle formalism, we, in, in, we bring in a self-consistent potential that has to do with the electron density, right? So that's an effective potential that takes into account all the other electrons. So the self-energy in a many-body framework does the same thing. We try to rewrite everything, so the entire many-body system, electrons and phonons, as a single particle equation for the electrons, and the effect of phonons come from this extra potential from the phonons that we embed in the self-energy, okay? So the self-energy is basically an effective potential caused by the phonons. Okay, next, uh, uh, is the mass enhancement valid, always valid for metal? Uh, yes, so the GW correction usually increases the Fermi velocity, will this effect couple to each other? Yes, they couple to each other. In fact, the correct way to do the calculation is to add the electron, electron self-energy from GW and the electron phonon self-energy. Okay, so one has to take both into account. Uh, this is not usually done, uh, uh, but uh, you know it's something that uh, probably in the future, as these calculations become easier, it will become more common. But yes, they, they must be both taken into account. And there is always a mass enhancement in any system. It's just that in some systems, it, it might be a little bit small. In others, it might be large. In the case of MGB2, I say this more than a factor of two, but MGB2 is one of the metals with the strongest electron phonon coupling. In some metals, it may be at the order of 10%, 5%, 20%. So it really depends on the system. Then the, uh, the question, is it possible to capture a plasmon phonon interaction with the non-adiabatic phonon self-energy? It seems to me that only single particle excitations are captured. Uh, that's a very interesting question. I think uh, uh, what you are asking should be contained in the uh, um, uh, dielectric function. Uh, 
of the system. So the 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 epsilon that I mentioned, basically the the, uh, the immersed dielectric matrix. Now the question is, what approximation we use for that dielectric matrix? Okay, and uh, uh, if uh, uh, we incorporate effects from uh, basically plasmon in the dielectric matrix, for example, carrier, free carrier screening in a, in a dope semiconductor, it should be possible to 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 get this kind of uh, features. I think that that should be possible. Okay, okay. Next question. If still, after that, we need to move on to the next talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I stop here, or, or should I? We can yeah. go one more question, and then the okay. other maybe answer. Uh, so, so yeah, okay. The question is, why did you consider displacement in phonon self energy while in electron self energy it was positions? Uh, that's a, a good question. So, the the I mean the 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 answer is um, the fact that. If we try to describe the problem as electrons and nuclei, we do have an issue because nuclei may have different spins, and then you don't know if we are talking about bosons or fermions, okay? And different isotopes may have different spins, and that's a problem. So what we usually do is to assume that nuclei are oscillating near the equilibrium sites, so the quantum particles are really the displacement from equilibrium. Okay, and that's uh, the way to proceed. Otherwise, things get very complicated. Of course, this is only possible in the case of solids. If you are studying, for example, uh, uh, molecules, it, it gets much more complicated. Okay, I think I should stop here, Oksana, otherwise uh, uh, there is not gonna be time for